those of you who know me, I'm Cole and I'm a sodaholic. It, it's always amused me though that that, that other organisation that, that does that, that anonymous mob AA, who are they? Amateurs Anonymous, that's it. So you're two, uh, two, two holics at the moment, and so <laughs> And amateur holic. Um, it does amuse me with that other mob though, because the first thing they do is being part of Anonymous is getting up and saying who you are. <laughs> Summit's on the air. How did it start? What is it? How do we participate in it? Can you get awards out of it? How do you activate? What equipment? And safety. I'll try and skip through this as quickly as I can, but uh, hopefully you'll be able to follow. We are running a bit short on time. Pretty straightforward for as long as there's been radio. Amateurs have taken their stations to the tops of hills. It's perhaps a little surprising then that no formal program for activating summits existed until March 2002. Tops of Hills, anywhere else, operating. <coughs> uh, it was a quote from Radcom in July 2004. How did it start? Uh, particularly with, a, with an idea of, um, of John in the, the UK, and developed along with Richard, launched on the 2nd of March 2002. <coughs> It's an internet-based activity. Why is it internet-based? The, the logging and the rules and all that side of it all happens online. Other than that, it all happens on radio, of course. In Australia, it started in 2012, here in Victoria. You can see the, the dates of the, the various arms of, uh, of soda within Australia. But starting here back in 2012. I didn't really get involved heavily into it for a couple of years after. Uh, it has an, an industrial strength database, once again online for, for, the, for the whole database, which we'll have a look at live a little bit later. More than 10,500 registered users at the present time. Uh, the website, which we're talking about and have a look at later, for alerting, spotting, uh, there's, a there's a forum on there as well. There's 120 associations around the world presently and growing, over 5,000 activators and over 100,000 qualifying summits. And this is growing every year. The summits themselves aren't growing, although some are. <laughs> but we won't go into that. <laughs> What is it? That's that pointy bit at the top, isn't it? Of the mountain? Yeah. Generally, yes. But you don't have to be right on the very peak. Uh, summit's on the air. It's an award program. Although it's not a contest. It's an activity. It's an open-ended activity. In which radio amateurs and short wave listeners can uh, participate. And the activators operate obviously in mountainous areas. It's been carefully designed to make participation possible for everyone, not just the activators who ascend to the peaks, as there are awards uh, in addition to those activators uh, to chasers, people who make the contact with those activators, and also short wave listeners. And to be a short wave listener, you don't necessarily have to be an amateur, you don't have to be licensed. You can't transmit, of course, but you are listening and recording that, uh, that QSO between the two amateurs. So shortwave listeners can participate. Uh, there's generally one set of generic rules for everyone. They have been varied a little bit, <coughs> which I'll cover a little bit later. Uh, DX entities f uh, form one or more associations. The Americans and the Canadians are a little bit different because of the size of it. They've, they've got multiple ones. The associations maintain lists of the summits within their own associations. The scoring is based on the elevation in that particular association. There are variations there because where you, you might have some associations at their summits and nowhere near the altitude of what others are. So they even the points out by uh, scoring based on the elevation in the association. 
As I said, the activators, chasers, and shortwave listeners are participants. There are various awards, there's honour rolls. Uh, not a contest as such, but you can keep score and look at other people's scores and see how you're comparing against others. So it can be a personal challenge to compete. Total internet based administration and patterned after islands on the air. That's not all of the associations, it's a bit of a sample of them. Um, as you can see, Australia, VK, uh, ZL, I've got them added in there, or not? New, uh, new Zealand's fairly new, they've, they've just been coming on board fairly recently. So, when is a peak not a SATA peak? There's a lot of confusion over this, and I hope I can explain it sufficiently that you'll understand. So a qualified SOTA peak is when there's a prominence greater than 150 metres from surrounding peaks. Now by prominence, it's 150 verti vertical metres on all sides of that, that peak. So it must drop away a minimum of 150 metres on all sides from surrounding ground to qualify as a peak, regardless of what height that actual peak is. So vertical separation, 150 metres. Uh, it should be a readily accessible summit, somewhere that's not just impossible to get to. There are some, well, there's quite a number of them, which are on private property. So you need to obtain permission from the landholder to obviously enter their private property. Majority uh, public areas. And obviously we have to observe um, any indigenous or government properties which you also may require permission to enter. That sort of spells it out a little bit clearer, I hope. So you've got a peak there, well, you've got three. That one in the middle doesn't qualify, even though it's higher than that one. Reason being, there's only 50 metres difference between that saddle and that peak. Remember what we were saying before, it has to be at minimum of 150 metres. That one qualifies, of course, because it's 200 metres. And that one, you have got that, that that's much greater, of course. The total peak is, is 400, and that's 280, so the difference qualifies that one. Everyone understand that? Does that make sense? If it's not in the database, if it's not in the database, you can't claim it. Yeah, well, so someone else has registered it somewhere. Yeah, so if it's not there, and you believe it should be, you can tell the area manager and they'll include it if it, if it does qualify. And we do find sometimes that sometimes the data is a little bit out, and some summits may qualify now, but they may not qualify later, they find it's not quite right. So it does get adjusted, it does get reviewed and adjusted periodically. So someone monitors the fault lines in California to make sure they're still with them? <laughs> yeah, well, like we said before, you know, sometimes they do grow a little bit, or shrink as the case may be. Would all of the summits be pretty much now confirmed in, in Victoria? Or like pretty much, or yeah. 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 Uh, there's, there's quite a lot of them, and we'll have well, We'll see a bit of a demonstration on that later. So we talked about scoring. So based on the above sea level elevation of the qualified peak, it varies by association, but the, these rules are right across Australia with this scoring system. They can be different in other countries because they can have some really high, high peaks. We can have some that aren't very high at all. So what we've got there for one point is um, anything below 500 metres, they're all above sea level, so I won't go into that each time. So one point, anything under 500 metres, between 500 and 700, two points, greater than 700 or less than 900, four points, and so on, I think you get the idea there. There is uh, bonus points available, if you are brave enough or silly enough to ascend to some of these summits in the winter period 
typically between June, 15th of June and the 14th of October. The reason for that being is those high peaks are generally subject to snow and ice. You can be lucky uh, before the, at the beginning or, uh, or, or around there. But the snow's gone but it can still be fairly cold and uncomfortable. Uh, so there are three bonus points if you activate any of those which are greater than 1,200 metres. So, how do we participate in this great activity? Basically three categories, activators, those who activate the peak, you take your gear up to the mountain top, chasers, who work that activator. Chasers can be anywhere. You can be home in your shack, out in your car, portable somewhere. Even another activator on another peak is also a chaser because they are then chasing that other activator somewhere else. There is another a separate category for that, for some, some context. Shortwave listeners, those who can just confirm hearing that, uh, that conversation between the two parties. Each group scores points for their participation and those points then go towards various awards. I'll come back to the addresses later so don't panic too much if you want to jot them down. Uh, it, it, does, uh, it did originate in the UK as I say and everything goes through uh, the, the UK and I'll learn how to drive this properly in a second. Uh, so it's the main site on the SOTA program. These two is what you will use the most for adding your alerts. So what's an alert and what's a spot? An alert is advance notice that you're going to go out and activate. So you're telling people ahead of time, it could be an hour, it could be a day, it could be a month ahead of time, you just put it down, it's just a date. It's an appointment basically saying, I'm going to be on this peak on X date, X time which you can edit and delete and everything if you like. Spots is when you're actually there on the summit, ready to activate or just sit, red, setting up and ready to go. So you're telling people, I'm, I'm either here or I'm just about to start transmitting. Maps, we know what they are. The forum uh, is a discussion online. You need to register to participate especially as an activator. As a chaser, an activator can speak to any licensed amateur who doesn't have to be registered to be able to log that contact. But without an activator being registered, it can't go on the database. So you need to actually be registered. And if you want to get the points and contribute towards awards, naturally you need to be registered. And the database, is to log our contacts on the main database. And you can look at any activator worldwide, any registered activator or chaser, and see what uh, they've been doing. We'll have a look at this live. But you can see on that one, that gives a brief overview of, of the latest spots and the upcoming activations. So there are your alerts, the upcoming ones and the latest spots. You can go in individual screens which give you a lot more detail of, of each of those, which we'll have a look at later. When you, I'll just go back to that one again. When you mouse over one of these summits, it will come up and show you where it is, a bit of information about it. And when you click on it, it will give you a lot more detail, telling you uh, what it is, VK2, obviously it's in New South Wales, uh, that is the particular area, SM, that's the Snowy Mountains, and the actual summit number, 052, the name of it, what its height is and how many points it's worth. And you can actually see down there who activated it first and uh, the few of the latest ones. You can have a look 
of where this location is in Google Map, Google Earth, uh, on a, a street map, and, the, and there's a separate SOTA map as well. So there's a lot of re resources that you can actually see. Obviously using Google, which I predominantly use, Google Maps and Google Earth, apart from the actual maps themselves, you can use the, the satellite imagery to, to get a bit, bit of an idea of where it is. Uh, there's honor rolls. That one there is obviously from Victoria. There's a chaser. I'm in there. And Phil's in there. And I think Phil might have been a little bit slow putting some of your lo logging because I'm sure you've got a lot more points than no, that. Not that many. Yeah, I think you have. You, you've either missed writing them down or something, because I'm sure that you've got more. I'm probably there too, so I'm going to put a few down. Graham, can you see that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I was, out, I was down there too. Months, uh, and, it's, uh, and it does build up. You'd be surprised how quickly. Uh, I've amassed most of those in two years. Same deal with the activator. What I've done on this one, though, uh, I've given all associations. So that's worldwide. There's a drop down box. We can have a look at that later. So you can narrow that down to each areas, such as PK3, 4, 2, 1, whatever. Uh, any, any other country. Or all associations is the whole lot. So you have a look at, at some of these these points for uh, for activators. That's not bad. When you consider some of those summits are only worth one point. This guy's got nearly eleven thousand. Now, mind you, they've been going for a lot longer than we have in Australia. But some of some of these people uh, truly are sodaholics. They just walk around over the peaks, do they? I think they do. I think they're... They, 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 have, they have categories of the, the awards. And can you get them? Well, you certainly can. And there's various categories. The Mountain Goat, which I think some of these people are crossbred with. The ones who are activating, they go for the Mountain Goat Award, which is a thousand activating points. Uh, a shack sloth is for those people who are chasing and the thousand points in that entitles you to the trophy. So you've got the trophy now, haven't you? Uh, it has, I haven't received it yet, otherwise I would have brought it in. But I have got the one. So many packs, are they? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> that's so many yeah, that's right. Yeah, or they look like those, those little... Um, Air, little air, air package bags. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Take them. I need you at the PDF file and you just print them off. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Just change your name. Uh, so as you can see, I've got the um, the Shaxloth Award certificate for a thousand points of chasing. I'm up to about seven thousand something now. So I'm chasing. So there are. There's also the Shaxloth Award for shortwave listeners for a thousand points. There's Various other awards, such as uh, summit, summit contacts, uh, numbers of unique summits that you've made contacts with. Uh, there, there's quite a number of, of variations that you, uh, you can get. Certain bands, VHF and above. There's uh, microwave categories, there's a whole stack of them. And uh, certificates can be issued to you uh, at, uh, along the way. So how do you start activating and what should you use? It's pretty much how long's a piece of string question. Because so many people use so many different things. The easiest way to get on air, the cheapest way, if you're just starting out, you don't have much gear, certainly not in a portable capacity, use your little handheld. Your dual band, whatever you got, can be single band. It's actually easier when you're activating a summit which is closer to a, to a city, Mount Dandenong, Mount Macedon even. But if you're closer to a city, there's a lot more chasers likely to hear you on, say, two metres or 70 centimetres. 
The band of, of choice that most people use is HF. There's a lot of very, very small equipment. Uh, some of the people have brought, brought in some of their radios and gear, which you can see on the tables. The, we'll have a look at some in, in a minute, but uh, CW is, is certainly increasing in popularity. Uh, sideband is the most common mode. But you can use any, any mode or band that you're licensed to use. Band. Yeah, if you're, if you're um, licensed to use it, you can, you can use it. It doesn't matter what it is. The, the most common, without doubt, in Australia is 40 metres. There's a few activators who uh, are looking to uh, qualify their summits on the higher bands. The HF, UHF, and above. So they're, they're, they're particularly trying to chase points in those other categories. So you don't have to be a mountaineer. There are some summits, in fact, there's quite a number of them, that you can actually drive to the top. There was a rule until fairly recent times that the activation zone is within 25 vertical metres of the summit. So from the summit to 25 vertical metres down from it, anywhere within that area is deemed to be the activation zone, and it still is. What you had to do, if you were able to drive to a summit, was you had to take all your gear in your backpack or whatever means, you had to walk out, had to carry it out of that activation zone and walk back in because the rule was that you had to make that final ascent into the activation zone by non-motorised means. You could use a bike, push bike, uh, a horse, no motorised means. They've relaxed that rule in Australia. So you can drive to the top, but you can't use the vehicle in any way whatsoever. No hooking up from the battery, no using the antennas on the vehicle. Basically, if, you can, if someone can get in your vehicle and drive it away and have no effect on the operation of your station, that probably is OK. Um, so that only Sorry, Grant? Uh, I think there's a few others that are doing it, but yeah, they, they certainly did relax it in Australia. Uh, and when I say you can't use a vehicle in another way, in addition to the methods that I've mentioned, can't use it as a windbreak. Can't use it as a support to put your radio on or anything like that. So, and uh, of course, you can participate from your shack or anywhere else as a chaser. But if you are inclined to, to go up on a, a mountain peak and have a go at this, uh, there's many unactivated summits yet to be done. So it's a good excuse to enjoy the outdoors, uh, the summits. Great, just for a bit of bush walking, a bit of hiking, get out, get a bit of exercise. It's great, so uh, you can combine those sorts of hobbies together. What do you need? Obviously, some very important things. Not going to make much contact with that. You don't need a radio. You need a power source. You can't use a generator. Solar is permitted. But a, a battery source is typically the way that everyone goes. I use those. It's a lithium phosphate, lithium ion phosphate battery, just a different chemistry from the lithium ion. Uh, a bit lighter, a little bit more um, voltage in those, and the, uh, the, the safer chemistry. You need an antenna. You need to be able to support that antenna. Supports can vary. The, the most common support, certainly for a wire antenna, for a dive hole, is a good old telescopic pole. It's a good pole. Just extend it up.
and that's what the majority use. Of course, you can use whatever available to you out there in the bush. You can throw a line over some trees, pull your antenna up like that. Uh, I'm referring, of course, to wire antennas, and as I said before, the majority are. HF, so that's what we'd use. Let's jump back on that. Uh, we need connecting cables, of course. You need some form of a log. There are some apps with electronic logs available. In fact, there's one I'll show you later on which has been written specifically for SOTA and porta, uh, portable operating by uh, one of the soda guys. Personally, I prefer the paper and pen. If you're really proficient electronically, it's really hard to listen uh, and be keying, typing the information in at the same time because you can get numerous callers coming in at once to you. Personally, I find the paper log much easier and then put it on the database some stage later. The beauty of the electronic version is once you've got it all in there, you can just trans the whole, transfer the whole thing as one file into the, into the, uh, the main database. A key for CW, something to, to carry your gear in. And I actually find that headphones are a necessity. Two reasons. One, obviously, so you can hear some of those difficult contacts. And the second one is, is you really don't want to be disturbing the public. Because you may be operating on summits that are quite regularly frequented by other people who are sightseeing. So you, you really don't want to be disturbing too much of the, of the person by, by having a speaker blaring away with snap, crackle and pop, squealing away. So I find headphones are are essential for me. That, 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 that's a personal preference. Safety. Obviously if we're going to be going out in the great outdoors, we've, we've got to be careful. It's the utmost importance for soda or any activity of similar nature if you're bushwalking. So confidence rule, don't take risks. There's enough dangers out there already without adding to them. But soda doesn't add to the risks, the risks are already there, it just depends on what you make of them. Mountain peaks are dangerous, including wildlife. Some wildlife may not be too happy of you infringing on their, their area. So there's some golden rules, and it's actually it's common sense. So don't take out normal unreasonable risks. Keep track of the time, especially in winter. Why? It can get dark on you very quickly, and obviously the cold. The Americans must have fun living some of this. Mountain lions? Yep. Bears? Bears? Bears. Yep. Other Americans? <laughs> Not very <laughs> far. <laughs> Park rangers? Yeah. And Canadians. Oh, well, we're, 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 we're careful of drop bears. <laughs> drop bears? Yes, that's right. Uh, but yeah, there, there certainly are risks. And uh, especially in the winter, and you probably notice that if you've ever gone up a mountain, that, that temperature is dropping as you're getting higher. Make sure you're uh, bringing water and drinking, especially in the warmer months when we tend to vent venture out more. Carry some food and uh, be prepared for emergencies. Tell someone where you're going in approximate time it's your return and obey the laws. Suggested list, maps, topographic. You really need to know where the peak is. This doesn't apply quite so much to the, your drive up summits and the easier, the easier ones, but there are some that people will hike an entire day for to get up there. So you need to know the best way to get there and to get back. So maps are a good idea, don't rely entirely on a GPS. The compass and a GPS uh, together with those maps is pretty important. 
sunglasses and sunscreen, as we say, the, your food and water, some extra clothes. It might be just another layer for, uh, for the cold, but if you get wet, you might need to, to change. Uh, a headlamp, one that's suitable for outdoor use, or a torch, some f first aid, uh, something to start a fire with. That can be the, the flint type fire starters. I'm not suggesting a blowtorch or anything like that, but uh, some matches usually will suffice. Uh, a knife. Under the law, you'd be permitted to carry one, as long as it's not. Uh, because you've got a valid reason for it. Uh, a personal locator beacon. And your phone may not have signal coverage. You could take a radio for safety. You could indeed. But sometimes your radio may not work. But I have got an example exactly that fits this scenario. Just sort of something else, Cole, too. Yep. But, uh, I just thought of something recently also that would be handy, uh, which I might do next time. A little clock on UTC time. Yeah, yes. In front of you. I, I um, have a, a dual time watch yep. and I leave it on UTC because we log every contact in UTC time. Why? Because it's consistent worldwide. So, yeah, important point. Everything's logged in UTC. So I leave my watch on there. I know others carry a little clock or set another watch or something that they can view. Yeah. It's easy to see the time to, to jot it down. Yeah. Hello, Chief. What can go wrong? Just about anything. We can leave equipment behind. Many people have done that. You can break a cable, break an antenna, whether it's by you. I've had one with a branch collapse at Mount Alexander and take out my antenna and scoop on. Um, connector problems are fairly common. People find after a while sometimes they have a bit of a dodgy connector. But make sure you, your gear's in, in good condition before you actually take it out. That one, I know I've lost count of how many people who have said you know, they've operated for five minutes and their battery's gone dead, forgot to charge it. Uh, a spare battery's always good to carry. Injuries, quite easy while you're bushwalking. Fall, sprains, fractures. And I put sunburn in there as an injury because anyone who's had bad sunburn uh, knows that, yeah, it can be quite serious. Sudden illness. You've got medical conditions. Those two, particularly that one, dehydration. It's very easy. You get carried away in the moment, the excitement of getting all these contacts and everything, forget to be taking fluids. So that and that are very easy to, uh, to occur to you. You can become lost, become disoriented. Once again, your maps. Your GPS and everything can help you. We don't have the, uh, the issues quite like the big animals, kangaroos, maybe, but certainly these things get out and about. Spiders, bees, if you happen to be allergic to them. Anaphylactic shock can kill you, so you need to be aware of that. They're the people who probably carry EpiPens. Uh, insects such as mozzies, some of them, I swear they're that big, they're really that big, uh, you will encounter them. And livestock, it can even be like uh, cattle or sheep, it can be uh, very curious. What can go wrong? The unexpected. That car belonged to Peter, VK3PF. This was actually a write-up in AR magazine. He was very fortunate. There was another amateur, uh, Tony, VK3CAT, who was about 10 minutes behind him. And Peter hit a pothole, heard something go pop, got out to have a look, and flames were starting to come out. He managed to rescue most of his gear out of there. This was somewhere in the, uh, down in Gippsland, in the high country. 
took two and a half hours for the fire brigade to reach him. Middle of summer, they were very, uh, I think that, that's Tony there actually. Uh, it was an interesting scenario because there was no mobile phone coverage. They managed to get Tony's um, gear in the car, HF, and two of us were on the other end of it. So we were able to convey the information and pinpoint where he was and uh, direct the, uh, the fire crews in via triple zero in Ballarat Esther. But I will be very pleased to uh, tell you that the digital communication CFAs, digital comms, with the, uh, with the trucks out there work brilliantly. But there was no mobile phone coverage. So had Peter not had somebody else close by uh, and, and stop, stopping that from spreading into the bush could have been a very different outcome. Was the car still burning when the fire crews arrived? Uh, it was smouldering. So principal rules for activators. We can use our cars, motorbikes, whatever, other motorised transport to the site, but we can't use any part of the vehicle to operate our station, as I mentioned before. We must operate from a portable power source, other than a generator. We must carry all the equipment to the operating position. We must make at least four QSOs to qualify the summit. One contact counts as an activation of the summit but you don't get the points. So you must have a minimum of four to get the points for that summit. You can only obtain the points from a particular summit once per calendar year. You can activate the summit as many times as you like, but you can only claim the points once per calendar year. Chasers can get the points of contacting an activator on that summit and get the points once a day. So if you get three se separate activators, or even the same activator, what, say three consecutive days, the chasers who make the contact with that activator can claim their points for each of those, those days, but only once a day. QSOs via repeaters don't count. Not allowed to use a repeater. All the contacts must be simplex. However, you can use a repeater to arrange your contacts. For example, if you were local here, you could jump jump on RCV off Mount Alexander and say, "Here I am on." wherever, I may, may be on Mount Alexander for example, um, or Mount Tarangawa, Mount Ida, wherever you are, but you jump on the repeater and you say I'm here, uh, I'd like to make a contact uh, for soda, any stations, please call me on whatever frequency. So you can use the repeater to arrange your contacts, but not to actually make the, uh, the soda contact via that repeater. Uh, it's a lot easier these days with smaller equipment. Uh, there's typical radios. The most common one is the little FT817 from Yaesu. And I think, Tony, you've brought yours over. Yeah, yeah. So. Just grabbing the eight, the eight one seven. There's the slightly bigger bigger version of it, which is the the eight five seven. Yeah, bigger again. It's the eight nine seven, which is the beast that I lug around. Why? Because I've got it. Uh, it's heavier and bulkier, but like the the eight five seven, it gives you up to hundred watts. The 817 is 
next to number five. These are also very popular in the solar world, the Elecraft KX3. Yep, which we've got there, KX3, KX series, they are very, very popular. Uh, and there's, of course, a whole range of handhelds. Typically for two metres to 70 centimetres. Very few handhelds have six, uh, but you will get six in the in the mobiles. Uh, they will do do six. And there's a, there's a lot of tiny QRP CW rigs available. Ones which you can buy, others in kit form which you can make up yourself. You can use anything you like. Uh, some of the activators like to go as low a power. That becomes uh, another challenge to them and there's also a category for QRP as well for awards. Some that we've had a look at. Some of the kits that are available that you can build up. And these don't have to be for soda of course, they can just be for general use at home or portable operating. Typically we need some form of antenna for a ship. I know some people have used things like buddy poles, people know what the buddy poles are? Like a couple of um, whips together, forming like a dipole. They can be set up vertically or horizontal or angled in different ways. But the majority of activators use a wire antenna, either a dipole, an NFEN fed uh, half wave, an off centre fed, whatever. Uh, Fiberglass pole, like a squid pole. A battery, uh, the lipos, uh, the uh, lithium ion phosphates, such as the one we showed you before. Other people ha uh, carry the big bricks around, the uh, acetyl lead acids, the slopes, uh, even, even car batteries, known people to carry around. You might need some bug spray, get the mozzies at bay. Uh, a throw rope and a weight is really handy to, as I mentioned before, to throw over a, a tree or some other support. Your first aid kit, you need your log and your pen, uh, know what the weather's going to do. What's close? Well, I suppose that's what's close to us. So here we are, and I'll give you a bit of a look live on this. This is, this is taken from uh, Google Earth. And this part of the soda mapping, in which you can get off the website, is adding in all these peaks. You can add them as a single summit, as a, uh, a single area, a whole state, the whole of the country, the whole of the world if you want it, it'd be a big fire if you did it. Um, but when you put your mouse over these, and or click on them, when it's live on the, uh, the website of course, uh, it will come up with the information on those summits. It shows there the, uh, the designator for it, Mount Alexander, VK3, Victor November 016, uh, Mount Tarangara, Victor November 023, so on and so forth. So you can get an idea just looking at them. And the different colour codes, I don't know whether you can make them out, it's a bit difficult, but they've actually got numbers on them. They're colour coded and they've got numbers, and, and those numbers are the amount of points valid for that, that particular summit. There are apps for your phones, or tablets, devices. Uh, a couple of really good ones. Most popular for the iPhone is Soda Goat. What these apps do is they will give you the, uh, the spots. So when someone is up there and activating, they, they, they put a spot up on the website, the app on the phone comes up and tab you, tells you that that person has just lodged that spot and where it is and what, what band they're on. Uh, uh, frequency. So you can go and look for them. Uh, the, um, the Android version which I use is Rucksack Radio. Well, the, the Sotagate has a, a tone 
that uh, bleeds the salmon and goat. Uh, you may be able to change it. Uh, I guess you probably can. I know the rucksack radio, you can have tones. Uh, I actually use a voice enunciation. It actually reads it out rather than just getting a tone and you have to go and look at it. You can actually hear. Repeat a book. Whilst it's not necessarily a, a particular app for SOTA, what it does is it tells you all the repeaters that are around you and you can punch in over what distance away that you want it to read, which is really, really useful, especially apart from SOTA, if you're travelling somewhere you want to find out where the local repeater is, you just punch this app up and it'll tell you all it is. It'll tell you what frequency it's on, if there's any tone on it, where it is. That, that one is really, really, uh, really, really useful. As we said before, you can't use a repeater to make a contact, but you can use it to drum up some contact. Uh, we need to log our, our contacts. So as a chaser or an activator, you need to log it. Obviously, if you're not registered as a chaser, you can't log it. But the activator certainly has to be registered and must be able to log it. There needs to be some sort of check in the majority of cases that they can cross-reference to see that the, uh, the QSO has occurred. So it can be, as we mentioned before, on a paper log or electronic, and you just then add them onto the database. What you need to do when you're making contacts is you need the activator's call sign, the chaser's call sign. One of those will be your own, one will be the other parties, of course. And the summit identifying code. So whether you're activating or chasing it, you need to be noting that down. The date and the time, the band and the mode, and an exchange of signal reports. What I do, there's a section there called notes in the login which we'll have a look at later. And I actually put down the person's name that I made the contact with and the signal reports that were exchanged. You don't have to do that. What you do have to, you must re exchange your signal reports and confirm that you've, each of you has received them at the time of the contact but they don't have to go on the database log. Sort of seems a little bit silly to me, but uh, if you're exchanging them, uh, that you don't, it's not mandatory, but I do it. It's a great record to be able to go back and see who the person's name was, rather than just the call sign. Plus also, possibly I was thinking too, having that extra information file down the track, you might use that contact for some other uh, award or something like that and you, you might well yeah you do uh, uh, it's great uh, you know, it's a great reference and what I'll do uh, and we'll open I'll put some more sheets in here but I carry a cheat sheet as an activator it's really difficult because you can get uh, a lot of people coming back to you. It's really, really handy to know. It's full signs and names. It's all I've got. Yeah. Have a look at later. It's just, uh, yeah, they're call sign and their name. And you get to know them, the regulars. The ones that you don't, it's, it's really handy when you hear them. It's really nice to be addressed by name if you have to do it. So I, I, I just carry a cheat sheet. And others do as well. This makes it a little bit easier. Talked about the logging before and the electronic version. Peter Fraser, VK3ZDF, has written an application. Uh, it's only available for Android. And you can download it. It's, it's free. Uh, you can actually use it uh, for being portable or even in the shack as, as a logging tool for, for anything. It's very, very versatile. So we ready to go out and give it a shot. I know a few of the guys have been interested. And pardon? Yes. Yeah. 
I've got these later at the end anyway. Yeah. And if, and if anybody needs any information, just give me a shout. I'm more than happy to help oh. out. Didn't hear anything. Yet. So uh, yeah, we can go chasing, go activating. Uh, use the internet-based tools for alerting uh, and spotting. To spot while you're on a summit, you obviously need to have signal uh, off, off, your, off your smartphone or other device. Uh, off laptop, whatever, but you need signals. So you may find that you get up there, especially if you haven't been there before, and you've got no signals, so how do you do it? Typically, there's some frequencies that people monitor all the time. 40 metres, 7090 is a common one. It's a call channel, call frequency. There'll usually be someone hanging on the, on the end of it, just about any time. Uh, so you can get that chaser who's probably sitting at home, more often than not, with access to their computer and they'll put the spot up for you in the database and just so makes it. Chasers can do that anyway without... Chasers can do it. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, right. Exactly. You know, it, it's really, it's great and look, it, it's a great courtesy thing. It makes it a lot easier for an activator if someone ju just jumps on. Especially if you've got an alert there prior because people are expecting you around that time. And yeah, they're, they're listening out for you. Sometimes but I'll do that and I'll say, oh, by the way, I'll put you up. I'll, I'll, I'll put a spot up for you. And it saves you doing it. Because yeah. by this time, you might have quite a number of people calling you. And uh, yeah. Uh, APRS is used a fair bit to uh, see your progress where, where you travel. And uh, we, we log all our contacts on the database. Uh, but yeah, be careful, it is a big Is there any differences to the operating procedure, like the CQ uh, social? Or yeah, that's, and that, that's normally what you do, yeah. uh, and give out your location, your summit. The, 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 the so location be, yeah. that VK... Yes. The, that's right. Or would you use the name of the summit? Uh, typically, you can just drop it in as, as both. Uh, we, we mentioned a couple before. Uh, what was Masson? 007? BC 007, yeah. I think, top of my head. Yeah, yeah BC 007. Yep. Four so, Masson would be, you know, CQ SATA, CQ SATA, use VK3 LED portable on Mount Masson, VK3 you know, VC 007, uh, calling CQ. Uh, so, yeah, it's just make sure you've got the CQ SATA, the word SATA in there. Designating you're, you're looking for soda contact, <coughs> and you may very well, particularly weekends, find other activators who are on other summits. There's a separate category in there: the summit, summit contacts. There is, uh, well, literally a separate category of summit, summit points. So <coughs> you end up, you're an activator. You're also a chaser because you're chasing someone on another summit. Okay. And it's a summit, summit context. So you end up with three separate categories. And if you actually happen to be on one of the, the higher bands or something, you get separate points in that category as well. So there can be multiple ones. The database does most of it for you. Do you get any special points for, say, six meters CW? Um, don't people seem to be looking for six and ten meters. Yeah, there is, it is for six metres. There's category for six metres, but the mode I don't think is specific. I guess it's peak to peak and work very well. Yeah, some of the summit, you, you get some of the points, but yeah, I don't think it's right in there. I'm not 100% sure on that, but I'm fairly certain that um, you can claim awards. I know that there's some people that they, they will just do all CW. All of their activating is CW only. So you can actually claim um, awards for just all CW. Is that why they get a real transit? I was waiting for it, Kevin. <laughs> Before they learn how to speak. Well, yeah. so, oh, speaking of which, <laughs> not learning how to speak, but CW. <laughs> <laughs> what, what does 
Yeah. Press the any button. Must be loose, it's intermittent. So this, this was um, just a few weeks ago. A few of us uh, went, went up to uh, Ambassador. You uh, haven't aged a bit since then? Pardon? You haven't seen to have aged a bit since then? No, no. Um, it's, the timing was good because it's been very wet since about that point. Uh, Tony KKP was on Mount Tarangau, so we had a summer, summer contact. Uh, I made a few others as well. Were well, there? I don't know that bloke is. Uh, something flying the car. Yeah, that's right. Uh, strangely enough, Peter Parker, TK3 YE, uh, does that. He flies kites uh, and makes contacts. The kite supports the antenna, the wire. Uh, he often does things like that. He stands in knee deep water in the ocean uh, with, with a bracelet around his, his ankle with a counterpoise. I don't know about you, but <laughs> I'm not sure I'd like to have you know, the potential of RF. You use the power of Boston. It brings the fish to the surface at the same time. Uh, but yeah, there's, there's so many different ways you can do this. Uh, Graham and myself with the, the 897. Speaking of wildlife. South end of the North Bound That's it. Uh, Mount Buller. Um, pretty well fogged in at the time. You can see the, that's an end fed which I've actually got, got here and have a look at. So that's, that's 40 metres, that's, that's an end fed half-life. The, the beauty of an end fed is it can be very close to your operating position. So the connection's quite low to the ground. Inverted V on the squid pile. Uh, I don't think you can really make out the other side of it. It disappears very rapidly in the... The squid fog. poles are smashed to that side. Uh, yeah, that's a squid. The squid pole's there. Uh, it's just strapped to the, uh, the pole. If you can't read the sign there, you're not kidding. It does drop away, and especially in that sort. Of, that's a good example of how weather can be dangerous to you. Uh, one wrong step there, because you could barely see your hand in front of your face, and you can be history. Uh, anyone actually been up to the summit of Mount Bullock and seen the fire tower? The uh, yeah, little pyramid up there? The trigger point is inside the building. You don't actually see the trigger point. Uh, that's it there. The offside. Uh, so that's inside the building. Uh, as you can see, it's, uh, it's not fire spotting weather. The, uh, the covers are open, but yeah, you can't see anything there at the time. Is that smoke? That's what it looks like on a good day. <laughs> so there's, yeah, there's not a lot around it. That's what it looks like now. That's David, VK3 India Lima. Up there, there's not a rubbish bag. There's a person in that. It's his daughter. <laughs> it's, it's called a bothy bag. Uh, and it's common, uh, a lot of the guys carry one. It's just basically, it's, uh, it's a shelter. If you've got adverse weather conditions, rain, snow, wind, uh, quite a few of them actually operate inside one of these, these bags. They've got ventilation. Uh, and they're, they're quite warm. I believe that was uh, that was an, an inter-schools event or something for the kids skiing or something up there and David's taken the, the advantage of going up there and doing some soda. He's just strapped it to a pole. Once again, he's, it's an end fed that he's using. It's interesting, you slide down the mountain on the operating meter. It's exactly what he did.
melhores. That's not antenna, it's just string, it's, uh, but it is supporting the end of the, the antenna. Remember that, Phil? Yeah. That was your better half, wasn't yeah. it, with you? Yeah. It's Phil hiding, in, hiding in the rocks. Hiding in the rocks. That's um, Ray. Why are you? Mount Karong. Uh, it was, it was bitterly cold, wasn't it? It was, it was sleet that we actually got up there. It was a couple of years ago. That fellow there is Wayne Merry. He's the association manager for Victoria. I think maybe one or two other. So he is the fellow who's done all the work setting up all the database and everything for Victoria. And, and as I said, I think there's, there might be a couple of other areas he's responsible for as well. Also at Mount Karong. That was the first day, it was the first time you were out, wasn't it? First time that I've gone out and Ray Tampion, of course. We saw it before. Uh, he came up and did a presentation at the club. Some of you may have been here. And we all went out the next day. Now, now this, this guy's a good example of one that's been crossed with a mountain goat. I'm sure, he just powered up there and he, he was ready to do summit after summit. And we were struggling. He did have another one, I think it was Matt Kiura, I think, on the list from memory. And we, we opted to do an easier one, which was Matt Tarangara at the, the end of the day. We did three, we did three in the day, so I for first timers, that wasn't bad. I went back later, that one. Yeah. Big addition. Speaking of Tarangara, uh, Craig actually used your uh, drone to shoot the aerial. Aerial pegs from up there, which are great. Uh, as you can see, Tony KKB's down there operating. What I was saying before about proximity of vehicle, probably a little bit close. Technically, it's probably acting as a windbreaker. Yes, with it. Just someone else just pull up there. They did. That's not yours, is it? It's not yours. Well, the wind was blowing the other way, so. So there, so there you go. Just misses me. Yeah. Yes. Otherwise, you could be benefiting from the shade. Yeah. Although, actually, you didn't want it. It's probably fairly cool, I would imagine. Actually, it wasn't there earlier. Someone stole it and then decided to return it. Mount Tarangau, so I don't have any conflict. I usually park my vehicle over the other side of the, the tower. It's just so it's really away. So. No one can turn around and say, oh, well, that's a bit iffy, mate. No. All right. Um, have we got... Oh, we're running fairly late. Um, so I can actually have a look at... So everyone has... Want to have a... That's great. Because so many people can't say, what are you doing? Yeah. On that... That hill there, uh, another radio actor drew up next to us in the camper van and chatted to him. Another person talked about their grandfather being licensed and everything. So we had <laughs> quite distracting <laughs> uh, Yeah, it can be. People, people can't interrupt you. Yeah. Well, I had the same experience on Mount Tarangara as well. Yeah. People actually came over to where I was operating on that table and asked me what I was doing. And they were most of them most interested. I quite often go up there and uh, give out pamphlets. The uh, you know people yep. do inquire, not just social, but I'm just having lunch. So it, it's a good opportunity to get the message about the club out there and what amateur, ra what, a what amateur radio is, because a lot of people don't know what it is. I think oh, it's, you know, CB. Future members of the club and future uh, participants in amateur radio, where are they going to come from? The public. Public, of course. Get out there and the so you get seen and. Uh, Curiosity usually gets the better of some of them, and they, they come over and they're quite quite interested. Yeah, it's actually, it's actually take take by yourself, yes, mate, and you have a little sign on the table, and I've got a few months to an angle. If they work, look, walk up and you operate in CW, even if you're just sort of fooling around, they can you can just sort of point to the sign, and then they oh, they catch on to what you're doing. Yeah. 
So it's, it's a great opportunity. It costs us nothing. Free publicity. Okay, well, um, does that, anyone want to have a quick look at the, the online logging? Or do you want to pull the pin? Yeah, it is. I won't enter yours right now. It'll take a while to... Yeah. Uh, well, you've told me what I wanted to know or something. I, I got confused between um, people who are not participating, either like I work with contest stations like well, or like You're saying to me that you can enter them as chasers. Yeah, so you've actually got three categories. Yeah. from your operation because you, you were an activator because you made a summit, summit contact you were a chaser and you got summit to summit yes. as well That's right. so you're actually getting points in three separate categories once you've activated a peak uh, and worked your four stations that's it for the year uh, as far as gaining points yes you, you can still acti activate, you can activate as many times as you like, yeah. you just don't get the points. You can get summit to summit points still yeah. from operating on that, that peak again, activating again, but you're just not getting your activator points. And the only last question I've got about that is, if you go and activate again, do you still have to do four contacts that time? Two. Well no, well, no, because you're not getting points okay, anyway. Points, so, that's not so, so one one contact yeah. still counts as an activation. It's four points to qualify the summit and get your points. Yeah, that's right. However, New Year's Day, so if you get out there just before ten, work off. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. because it's it's a everything works on UTC time. We're very fortunate in Australia that UTC rollover into New Year happens at 11 o'clock in the morning. It's normally, we're 10 hours ahead, but it's always daylight saving, so it's 11 uh, local time. So what a lot of activators do is they'll go out there, say, between 9, nine o'clock and 10 o'clock on New Year's Day. It's still New Year's Eve, UTC. And they, active, and they activate that, that summit. After 11 o'clock, New Year's Day, you've rolled into a new year. So they, they're still there, but they just start logging again for the, another activation on that summit because it's a new year. So we're very fortunate to have that time zone here. Otherwise, the poor people in the UK um, there would be, and certainly in, in winter, the midnight um, for them. All right, just a, a quick look on this. Uh, this is a database, or rather the um, just the Soda Watch. So this is where you would enter your uh, activations. So they're, they're your um, alerts and the spots. So if I go into the alerts. So here, once again, all in UTC time. If we have a look, see what's coming up on Saturday. Okay, you'll s there's not many Australian ones happening this weekend. What we've got here is VK4, but that call sign there, that's a UK call sign. So what that is, is somebody from the UK operating in Queensland, portable and they're operating on that summit. Now, I don't know whether you can read that or not. The operator's name is David, and the summit is Flinders Peak. 609 metres, the elevation. Is it nine? Something else. Uh, and it's four points. I can actually click on that. And that'll bring up a lot more detail. It was 679 metres. <coughs> 
uh, and as we saw before in the example, who it's been activated by. So it hasn't been oper um, activated much at all. So I, I dare say it's probably only been activated twice. That particular one. So uh, we can scroll down. You can go as far. You can put an alert in as far ahead as you like. <coughs> when we start looking at um, now, here's another one. It's gone the other way around. It's a VK3. That's Tony, actually, the other fellow that was involved with the car fight. Uh, and that's a W7, which is in the States, I think. So he's operating there, and as you see, the, uh, the frequency and the mode, so he's, he's doing a CW. What thing is he Pardon? What thing is uh, uh, okay, I mean, I mean, what we can do too there... Uh, okay, well, let's, let's have a quick look at this. We've seen that, that screen before, gives the information. But what we've got down here, we've got Google Earth, Google Maps, right? We can click on Google Map. And it'll show us where, or Google Earth, for example, where that summit actually is. I can zoom that out and get a bit of an idea of maps. Probably a bit hard to read. Um, Portland, that's Oregon. No, yeah, 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 Oregon. It's Oregon. Yeah. Uh, and we can. We can as you're probably aware with Google Maps, you can look at the map side rather than the satellite side, so you can zoom in. So it's, it's, um, it's a very powerful database of what you can do with it. So that, 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 that's where he is on that particular one. You can do that with any of them. Uh, we've got so here we are here. Uh, that's, that's two operators. Uh, and quite often people will go out and with someone else, another, another amateur. So you've got two, VK1AM and VK2MWP there on that summit. It's not, rec it's not recognising a name because they've put two in the one. Can you set up one station of both operators? Yeah, you can have as many as exactly what we did at Mount Macedon. You only need like one set of equipment because your logging is against the individual, not the equipment. So it's your call sign that it goes against your, your, your points. It's, uh, it's awarded to the operator, not to the station. Pardon? Uh, well, strange that you, sh you should say that because I think there was um, I may be wrong on the, the location. I've, I've got a vague recollection it was meant Buffalo. It was over 30 amateurs got up there. But some of them used, it wasn't just the one set of gear. They, they set up a few different stations, different bands so they weren't interfering with each other and, and might have been, you know, moved a bit over, over the other side of the hill a bit and things like that. Uh, recently, there was a, a VK1 soda party, so it was all the, the guys around Canberra, the ACT. Uh, they do it a, an annual thing, but they, they all get, it's a social get together and they all split up and they go to all the different peaks and they do some of the summit contacts with each other. And, uh, usually yeah, get together afterwards and have a you know, bit of a social function. Well, that's what happened on that day you were at Mount Tarangara and we were all at the coffee club. You know, we, we all went up to the hill in Castle Day. Yeah, I think that was, that was one or similar, but there was one just recently, I was at Mount Maligal and uh, all the, the VK1s, but it's not just limited to VK1s, of course. I mean, they do it as their own social get together, but all the other uh, chasers and other activators. It's, come, it's become a big thing. There's activators all over Australia and, and other countries listening as well for them. So you're still making these summit, summit contacts. Uh, so just about nearly all of the contacts that I made on the day were some of the summits. 
So yeah, so we're going to have a look and see. That's that's one of the snowy mountains where they are. That big Badger Hill. So that's 1362 metres. So that's over over the 1200 metre limit for the bonus points. So it's eight points. So you get but the activators will get three bonus points. Chasers don't get the bonus points. Pretty obvious why, because they're not out in the cold freezing their butt off. Uh, and we get, once again, we're going to have a look and see what that one is. It's a bit slow, this, this old girl. So it looks like there's a bit of a track leading up there. I don't know whether you can get a vehicle up there or not. So if you can't, it might be a bit of a walk, depending on the elevation. Have a look and see what the map looks like. No, it does look like a road, doesn't it? Uh, a lot of the summits uh, have pub public lookouts or fire towers on them, so they have pretty good access. But there are, are others that are quite difficult to get to. I mean, the Mount Karong was a good example. That was scrambling over rocks and through a bit of scrub and everything. It was quite a climb to get up there, but it's only a one-pointer. Whereas you can go to some of the real higher summits, such as the 10 pointers, that you might be able to drive up to. Uh, so the activators who are chasing points tend to go for the, the 10 pointers, whether they drive up or, or walk up. Yeah. So, so there's actually quite a few one, one or two pointers around that haven't been activated at all. Generally, because they take a f they may take a fair bit of effort to get up there, and people haven't bothered. But they're there, they're there to activate. There's no no extra bonus. It's just it's a personal accomplishment to be the, the very first activator. You don't get anything extra for it. So that, that's our. Um, so they're the alerts. If we look at the spots. This is what's happening at the moment. Typically you're not going to see any Australian ones because there's not people quite silly enough to be out on mountain peaks at the very moment. But you will find tomorrow morning that you will probably find spots. Just before you move off that, yep. just noticed in here Lona portable HF gear. Yep, that's, that's probably somebody either offering or asking. They've probably travelled overseas. Are they able to borrow somebody else's gear? And that happens a fair, fair bit, that they will perhaps go out with another amateur lo local in their country. Uh, but I have heard of situations where some of the amateurs in different places have loaned equipment for visiting amateurs to use. So I suggest that that's, uh, that's a, the uh, reflector. So that's a forum. So you can go on those and look at the, uh, all the, the subjects of what there is. I won't go through it now, but you get the idea. The database is where we do our logging. There's a lot more available in the database. So to submit a log, We'll say submit an activator. It's going to want to log in. So it's a username and password, which you have to register for. And once you get past that, um, it's, it's pretty straightforward of the peak that you're activating, the date and uh, you just log your contact in there. I won't go through it because it's going to take... Uh, I was planning to go through it, but we're way behind time. Uh, one thing I really do want to show you in that, in that database is the mapping, the summits. You can search for summit, as in find them. Uh, see what ones have been activated recently. 
there's a whole swag of information available off off this this site. If we go in here. And this is probably going to be a bit, a bit slow, but we want to. Um, it's very slow. I'll go in multi. If I choose multi, I can choose more than one association. Uh, like we could have VK3, for example. But I can say I can say I want VK3, VK2, I want all of Australia. Uh, I can, I'll just scroll down the list. Um, okay. So let's say just VK2 and VK3, just out of curiosity. It'll, it'll be quicker to load if I don't put them all in. If I want the region, because they're all divided up, such as like VK3, uh, it's central and northeast, East Gippsland, north central, southwest, etc. So you can just narrow it down into those those areas. But I'll just I'll click on that. And multi areas too. You can like like for example I can do the whole of Australia if I wanted, but it'll take a while to oh, yeah. download it. Okay, and, and what that's done is that that's put, they're all soda peaks. A bit hard to see it on that. And if we go down, if we go down to here to export, we can select the same thing down here. I don't know where I find them. Uh, I'll, just, I'll just select uh, three, three and two. And how we want to export it. Typically, a GPX file would be what your GPS will use. A KML file is what Google will use. So if I export that as a KML file, we'll just say create the file it's downloading it now so that's downloaded the, the, the summits for what I've selected for VK2 and VK3 and I've just clicked on that and that should load into Google Earth for me bit slow. Similarly you can put it into Google Maps. And there's all our summits in VK2 and VK3. We've made a, uh, a file of, and you can, of course, turn those on and off in the maps, as you can with, with anything in Google Earth. I'll bring this across to. Um, as you can see in the in the. The colour the color coding's the, the points. It's, it's probably a bit hard to see, but the red one's like 10, 10 points. The cyan's 4, the green is 6, etc. Uh, as you can see, in the northeast of Victoria, there's a lot of peaks. Certainly a lot of higher ones which more, with more points. Bring it in closer to, to home. You can see them. Well, there's uh, Kiura. 
Ned Alexander is there. <coughs> so if I click, click on Ned Alexander, it comes up, and that's probably difficult to read, but you've got the latitude, the longitude, uh, the maidenhead locator, its altitude, the points, how many times it's been activated, who activated it last, Goodness me, it's VK3 GRK. So, here we go. This is uh, the, the Alexander. Yeah. So, so the, um... Now, if I click on that call sign, which happens to be Graham's, and wait, I think it was actually Con the Fruiterer. Remember, anyone yeah. remember Con the Fruiterer? He invented the, the internet. WWW, white in, white in, white in. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Beautiful. So that actually comes up with Graham's QRZ details just by clicking on his call sign. And there's this, Graham. What's <laughs> that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's four dollars off something. <laughs> <laughs> That's cute. It doesn't look like it's mine, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, sorry, not a lot. Yeah. So we'll just go back to um, Google Earth. So we click. That's just by clicking on that call sign that came up in there. What's but that? That to, fi to find out more information on the the actual summit, that takes you to the. That links you back to that page that we uh, looked on the database. So there's a whole stack of information that you can get. LEDGRK up here again. And LED. That's because we're, yeah, that's funny, isn't it? What about, Colin, what about, about COBOR? COBAR. Co no, COBOR. Co no, it's east of India. Uh, and yet it hasn't had that many activations, nor is there a... I, I think it would qualify as cursing a river. That northeast of the continent. Cobor, that one there. Yeah, what's it? What? Mount Cobor. Yeah. Um, uh, where is it? There. Yeah. Okay, so... It's, it's about 770 metres, I remember 780. Uh, 770, it says there. It's been activated 11 times. Last activated on June the 15th this year by VK3EQ Portable. Because you uh, get a clearer shot from there into Melbourne than we would when we were on See, there's, that's, that's the website with the information on that particular one. So it's a four pointer. Uh, just one thing to remember when you're activating. Uh, your call sign's always got the portable prefix on the end of it because you are operating portable, just the same as you would if you're operating portable anyway. Right, uh, I would have liked to have shown you a bit more on that, but... But that's it. You jump in, get around. Um, probably the what you do need is um, up the top. So that register. There's a couple of ways you can get into registering. That's certainly certainly one way. Separate registration for the inputting the, uh, the logs to, as I found it. Uh, yeah, to yeah. so the main main yeah. website. Yeah, separate registration. Separate registration. Yeah. Had me for for a lot of months. That is. So, all right. Um, any further questions? Sorry, it's so late. Something on the fact, uh, VK3 TWO, Heath uh, yes. and, and, and uh, VK3 
Vic Hayes 6, F and I in Monique, they would have loved to have come this evening, but unfortunately they couldn't. But Heath uh, left a lot of his gear with me, his sofa gear for us to have a look at. Antennas, everything you can ever imagine that you need for SOTA, um, Heath has here. And uh, he's also happy for anyone to ask, ask him questions about any equipment that uh, people might need. He also supplies some of the equipment, uh, like, uh, for example, uh, these radios here from China, the HF radios. Um, through that. They're also a, there's also a new, new model of these. He does have a, a website, and we'll make that available on maybe the video credits on Facebook. And uh, so, yeah, any sort of equipment, uh, batteries, um, antennas, um, uh, he's got a lot of information on his website, and he's more than happy to uh, provide information. That's that's um, that's his website there, spooktech.net. Uh, that's the one for the portal log. If you want to look at the uh, electronic logging. Yeah, yeah, I'll put this up. The info. Those those three are really really useful. Your um, SOTA Watch and SOTA Org UK just to uh, register and have a have a play with the site. There's also a Yahoo group for Australian SOTA, which is there. Uh, SOTA Beings UK, they have a, a lot of uh, a lot of gear for um, SOTA as well. Uh, so have a. If you haven't already done so, have a look at some of the gear. Uh, that's what, as I said before, that's it's an M fed half life for 40 meters. That's uh, yeah, yeah. Pull that, pull that down. That's uh, a flint dipole, a lightweight version of the one that I, I had previously. So three reels. Wire on the side, the uh, thin coax, the RG174, and just a bit of, so that acts as a, a third a guy, a back guy. Uh, the links you just join the clips together to lengthen the wire for the band, they're all cut to resonant frequencies for the various bands. You change band, you of course just drop the pole down, change the links over to the appropriate band and hoist it back up again. Uh, you get used to, you can do that fairly quickly. Uh, you can get multi-band ones. Uh, um, one that I haven't got around the pot make, making yet is uh, the off-center fit dipole. So that can do several frequencies without having to change lengths quite, quite handy. Uh, that's a charger that I use specifically for the lithium batteries. I will start a truck. Whether or not. Is there a special charge that's required? That is, yeah, with the chemistry. Uh, they're actually supposed to check when they're only about 40 or 40. But they will do uh, various types of chemistry, including standard SLOs. Um, certificates, I was saying that they're some. we just. That's around the time. Have we got some in there? Oh, yeah. I haven't claimed any. I just decided this was a claim some of them not. So they're all various, um, various levels that you can find. <coughs> and my trusty soda hat. Nothing, I've got to have the soda be. Makes your true soda tragic. <laughs> How does that enhance your soda experience? This, uh, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. one thing with any of the uh, lithium batteries, I recommend is the uh, Libo Safe bag. Basically, it's a fire blanket folded into a bag with uh, Velcro. So if you do happen to have a, a battery, have a bit of a thermal runaway, uh, you've got some form of 
some level of containment. Uh, just some little bags. Just keep stuff in. Door strings. Clips for your backpack. So yeah, have a, have a look at the uh, the gear and if anyone's got any questions about uh, activating or chasing or anything whatsoever, feel free to give us a shout. Thank you very much. Doesn't